Okay, so we're going to try something new here. <clears throat> so I'm trying to mix it up with making YouTube videos and uh, where I appear on the on the video and just record in my screen. So <clears throat> anyway, so this is a quick trial of something new. We'll see how it goes. Um, so looking at the these slides, these are notes available to my students, and I'm just going to look at them and try and do some voiceover and <clears throat> bring out some important features. So this is related to nuclear chemistry for a general chemistry audience. So in terms of the size of the nucleus, this diagram here relates to the gold foil experiment. Um, so when Rutherford shot the alpha particles, you can see the alpha particles here. When Rutherford shot the alpha particles at the gold foil, he noticed that to some extent, to a minority of occasions, the alpha particle came back. <clears throat> and upon closer inspection, so if you imagine the alpha particle here is the helium nucleus, so it's got, let's see if I can get my icon to move, there you go. The two positive charges here, uh, let's see if I can actually write on it. Um, yeah, so these two positive charges here, they represent the helium nucleus with its two protons. And over here, let's see if it's going to go, yes. This over here would represent the gold nucleus with not necessarily seven protons, but with a lot more than two. Uh, we know that like charges repel. So um, the positive charges of both the alpha particle and the gold foil would repel each other and so there'd be a, 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 a closest approach <clears throat> so let's see if i can scroll down and annotate there you go the alpha particle would stop a distance d from the target nucleus <clears throat> and would reach a distance of closest approach um, so let's assume that the alpha particle was moving so it will have kinetic energy and the kinetic energy will be this mv squared over 2 here. If I can get my pen to activate again. So this mv squared over 2, uh, this is kinetic energy. Um, mass velocity squared over the number 2. And we know this is equal to the energy because of electrostatic repulsion. Or at least we know because of conservation of energy that the kinetic energy of the alpha particle, because it's going to, the alpha particle is going to stop at a distance d, then it's immediately going to have to go somewhere, right? You can't create to destroy energy. So the kinetic energy is going to be converted to electrostatic repulsive energy, which is this K Q1 Q2 over R. So this is conservation of energy. Um, this is electrostatic repulsion this is hard i'm not actually not writing on the screen i'm writing on a pad next to me and i think i'm breaking some kind of record for doing cursive without writing on the screen anyway <clears throat> so kinetic energy equals electrostatic repulsion because the alpha particle stops K is a constant. Uh, Q1 and Q2 are both charges, so let Q1 be the charge of the alpha particle. So if you look over here, Q1 I've called 2E. Uh, e is the charge on the electron, which is has a charge in Coulomb. Um, 2 is because there's, so essentially the 2 is because there's two protons in the alpha particle. And the proton has the same charge as the electron, but opposite sign. So the proton is positively charged. It's numerically equal to the electron, but just with a different sign. Um, so that explains Q1 being equal to 2E. And the gold atom, I've called it ZE, where Z is the atomic number, <clears throat> which is just the number of protons in gold. If we keep it generic as Z, it could be any foil you like. It could be aluminum, it could be lead, it could be 
anything you like. Um, it's just the atomic number, which gives you the number of charges multiplied by a unit charge, E. Okay, and then R is a distance of separation, which in our case is called D. All right, so that's just to frame uh, this conversation. If we then solve <clears throat> for D, so you can see um, that essentially we set the equation on the right here equal to mv squared over 2. Uh, we cross multiply, you can try that yourself. <clears throat> and we can solve for the distance of closest approach, which is now 4kze squared over mv squared. Um, so again, we just do that pretty quickly. Uh, Rutherford knew that the radius had to be less than the distance of closest approach. That's because you haven't actually hit it because of the overwhelming uh, electrostatic repulsion. So the nucleus itself had to be even further away than the distance of closest approach, therefore it had to be smaller. Um, and the distance of closest approach, D, in this equation here, was calculated, so let's see if I can get it here. So this distance of closest approach, D, was calculated to be approximately 10 to the negative 14 meter. And if the radius was smaller than D, therefore the nuclear radius had to be less than that. Um, roughly speaking, the nuclear radius, R, is some fixed radius r0 a to the third where a is the atomic mass or the mass number uh, raised to the third power to the third th power or cube rooted i guess that's a quicker way to say it um, now because this is a fixed equation and it's approximation but because it's a fixed equation you can see that um, the size of the nucleus is dependent on um, how big the nucleus is, obviously, and the, how big the nucleus is depends on the mass of the nucleus. Now, because the <coughs> size of the nucleus depends on the mass, um, then approximately, and we assume that the larger the mass, the larger the volume because of electrostatic repulsion of like charges requires a larger volume to house that charge. Um, <clears throat> then the density being mass over volume, all nuclei approximately have the same density. And just to frame that to give you a, an idea of the size of the density, the density is approximately 10 to the 17 kilogram per meter cubed. Just to put that in context, Water or everyday materials that are made of atoms, roughly, so take water for example, a meter cubed of water is about 10 to the 3 kilos. So this is 10 to the, what, 10 to the uh, 17, so 10 to the 3, this is 10 to the 14 times more dense than water. 10 to the 14. And you have this material inside your body right now. So that's incredible. So uh, the nucleus is definitely not the same as regular matter. Okay, so that's the first page. Let's see if I can manage to get access to the second page. Again, we're trying this. This is a new way of me trying to present my notes to my class. Let's see. Okay, nuclear <clears throat> angular momentum. Um, you'll notice if you've looked at my videos on uh, quantum mechanics, introductory quantum mechanics for general chemistry students, you'll know that this equation looks very familiar. If we replace nuclear spin I for regular uh, um, electric spin S, then it's exactly the same. So we had S, S plus 1 H bar. Here we have I, I plus 1 H bar, um, or I, I plus 1, all rooted H bar. 
So go back to those notes and, and see the comparison. Here, I is the nucleus spin. Um, whereas the electron in the electric spin is, is a half integer spin, uh, the nucleus overall can either be a, a, a complete integer or a half integer. Um, and we can see here the nuclear magneton, uh, which is exactly the same equation as the Bohr magneton for the electron. Uh, mu n is the unit charge E h bar over 2 mp. Um, and that's approximately 10 to the negative 27 joule per Tesla. Um, we don't really look that in that much detail at the nuclear magneton in this course. So we'll just mention it in passing. Um, more for a comparison with the Bohr magneton for the electron, uh, which I've got here. So look at the similarity of these two equations. The Bohr magneton for the electron is the unit charge h bar, so exactly the same numerator. Exactly the same if we compare that numerator with that numerator. <clears throat> the number two is the same as well. We've only replaced the mass of the proton in the nuclear magneton because there's a nucleon in the nucleus versus we had the mass of the electron in the Bohr magneton. Now notice that the nuclear magneton, if I can get my pen to register again, is an order of magnitude, um, three orders of magnitude less than the Bohr magneton. So 10 to the 24 is small, but it's a thousand times bigger than 10 to the negative 27. Uh, and essentially, that's because of the ratio of mass sizes between the proton and the electron. So we notice that the <clears throat> Bohr magneton for the electron is approximately 2,000 times larger, or at least 10 to the 3 times, 3 orders of magnitude larger than the nuclear magneton. And that's related to the fact that the proton is about the same order of magnitude heavier than the electron. Okay. Um, okay, so that is all I wanted to, again, we don't really say much about that beyond passing it in, mentioning it in passing uh, at this general chemistry level. <clears throat> uh, perhaps this, I definitely wanted to mention this, this will definitely help students heading on to organic chemistry. Um, but the Lama uh, precessional frequency. So this is at the heart of uh, resonance imaging in not only organic chemistry, but in medicinal applications of physics thereafter. So let's have a look. So down here you have uh, a nucleus. So a collection of positive charges. And you have um, the nuclear magnetic moment, which I've got mu n, which is a vector. So it's this straight line here, this vector. And it will process. So you can imagine it has uh, a precession, which just means a rotation. So let's say it's rotating clockwise here. You can, you can actually see here. I've got a little arrow here. This clockwise rotation. And it's sweeping out a cone. So imagine this vector sweeping out a cone as it precesses, um, okay, in an externally applied magnetic field, B. So B is magnetic field, and it's oriented in the Z direction, which in this diagram is straight up. Okay, so, so what? Well, you can have nuclei, so for example, let's say nuclei are in the same orientation as the externally applied magnet magnetic field. So let's say the circle here is a proton and the little arrow is the vector of that proton aligned with the externally applied magnetic field B. If that's the case, that's one way the proton can be aligned. 
But then you've got the counter case up here. You can have the proton being opposed to the magnetic field. Now these are oversimplified representations. They're not going to be exactly aligned. But what I've exaggerated here to be completely pointing up and completely pointing down, in reality is maybe up would be maybe 50.0001% versus so that would be slightly greater than 50 percent so there's a slight fraction that statistically means it's not completely average being in the up direction um, and likewise down could be 49.999999 percent up so there's a slightly less than 50 percent and obviously a complete scrambling would be 50-50 exactly, 50.000. Anyway, so if you are statistically slightly greater than 50% up, then you would have a slightly different energy, E1, than if you were slightly pointing down, E2. And the difference is a sign, right? So instead of, so if we take this to be the Barry center, so when there's no externally applied field, everything's at the same energy. But then when we apply a field, we can either orient with or against the field uh, by the same degree. So these, um, my pen's gonna register any second. So this distance should be the same as this distance. And so we've got uh, a separation of the magnitude of the magnetic dipole mu n multiplied by b in the positive sense above the Barry center. So here, positive, positive here just means above the Barry center. And here, negative means below the Barry center. Okay, if we look at the change in energy, Let's see if I can get this. The change in energy is going to be that. Oh, sorry, my a little bit scruffy. I'm, I'm using this for the first time. I'm still a bit rusty on it. If we look at the change in energy between E1 and E2, so that's going to be delta E, which I have over here, then that's going to be the difference between E2 and E1. So the difference, and that's simply going to be, uh, let's say, E2, which is positive mu nB, minus E1, which is negative mu nB. Well, this minus makes that minus positive, so essentially we have two units of mu nB, which is two mu units of mu nB. Okay. So we've got a way to dis differentiate protons based on how the dipole moment orients with an externally applied magnetic field. And this is used in imaging. NMR is an acronym for nuclear magnetic resonance. Let's see if I can write that. Nuclear magnetic resonance so you will study nuclear magnetic resonance in organic chemistry which will come after this course those of you that are headed that way uh, but just a couple of mentions which can be picked up later in that other course a dc magnetic field so a direct current magnetic field is used to align the magnetic moments so that means we want the magnetic moments pointed in a common direction. A torque is applied via a weak oscillating frequency matched to the Lama frequency. So again, recall that the Lama frequency is the frequency at which this uh, vector of alignment between the, mag the magnetic moment of the protons and the externally applied magnetic field is precessing um, Oh, I didn't want to do that. 
Oh, I didn't want to do that. That's too big. Okay. So if we can apply, basically we can talk to that dipole if we can match its frequency. So if its frequency is the llama frequency, we can talk to it, we can communicate with it if we match that llama frequency. Similar to tuning a radio, a radio station, you have to get the receiver to be at the same frequency as the uh, emitter of the frequency, and then you can receive the signal. Anyway, the torque is applied uh, via a weak oscillating frequency. They actually use radio waves, but uh, you'll hear about that in, a, in another course. Um, and then the torque, because it now has the llama frequency, it communicates with the dipole moment of the nucleus, and it causes the magnetic moment to flip between the two states. And then you just look at the energy separation between these two states. Okay, so that's a quick connection between uh, the nucleus, the dipole moment of the nucleus, and something that's coming up in your next course. So not much, unless we make this an organic chemistry class, there's not much more I can say about that. Um, okay, so now acknowledging there's not much more to say about that, now we're going to start headed towards what will become focal in general chemistry, and that is to look at the nucleus proper and, um, you know, a lot of things that you might have thought about the nucleus, you might not have thought about the nucleus, but here goes. Anyway, um, I do want to take a little detour to talk about time dilation. Why time dilation? Uh, well, essentially, it's going to give us um, the Lorentz contraction. So I could have used a different type of um, relativistic effect, but I chose time dilation because I think it's the easiest uh, thing to communicate, and it will allow us to arrive pretty organically, pardon the pun, at the Lorentz contraction. What's the Lorentz contraction? The Lorentz contraction is what you need to understand the nucleus, uh, in my humble opinion. So without further ado, let's get on, keep this video as short as we can, and let's talk about time dilation. Okay, so imagine you have a train. This is supposed to be a train carriage. And as you can see, the train is moving um, on your screen from right to left. So the dash, you can see here, the dash like silhouette of the train here um, is where the train is headed. The solid lines are where the train is right now. And let's say you have a bulb so this is supposed to be, this thing here is supposed to be a bulb. That's me trying to draw the filament inside the bulb, uh, a light bulb. And it's in the train carriage at this uh, height h above the deck of the train. So this is a height h. And while the train is stationary, the light obviously would go in all directions. But we're interested in the in the piece of the light that's coming directly down. So you can imagine if you if you want to that the bulb is in a pinhole box, and only a beam of light coming directly uh, vertically down, immediately underneath the bulb is visible. And let's say that's that black line here, which is now red, I guess. So let's say that's the only beam of light that we can actually see because we've put a pinhole in the box, in the bulb, or we put the bulb in a box. Now the train is moving, let's say with a constant velocity v to the left, uh, as indicated here. And now if you imagine, at least in our diagram, instead of the bulb going immediately down, because the train is moving during, but importantly, after the light has left the bulb, we can imagine that the light now, the train or the floor of the train actually moves away as the light is coming down. 
So as the light typically is doing this and its wave coming down, well now that part of the floor has moved over here. So that means the light actually is going to hit the same distance behind where it would have ordinarily hit. And it's basically moved a distance V delta T because distance is speed times time. So the train was moving at speed V and the time it took for this, uh, this part of the train to reach, let's say here, caused the light to, instead of hitting here to go all the way over to here, a distance V delta T. Okay, so hopefully that orients you a little bit to what I'm trying to get at in this, um, in this little diagram. So this is just some spielage that you can look at. Um, so let's say there's somebody on the train looking at this and then there's somebody um, off the train. So if I'm off the train, I would see the train as I've drawn this diagram. Obviously, if you're on the train, you don't see the same thing. If you're on the train, you would just see, see the light come vertically down. It's only if you're off the train looking from a distance that you might see the light come at an angle. Okay, at least in our thought experiment here. Uh, so for an observer on the train, um, let's see, then we've got, um, we can have, um, this expression here where we've replaced V with C because we're looking at light and the velocity of light is a constant C. So instead of V dt is uh, a distance, we can say that C dt is a distance and we set that distance equal to uh, the height of the train. Okay. For an observer outside of the train, the light travels farther since the train is moving. Okay, so that all seems pretty reasonable. So let's see where this next page is. The next page is down here. make it big enough so that we're not seeing half the other page and totally get sidetracked. Okay, so here let's look at this tr this diagram, this triangle here. So just to orient you with the previous page, we're going to imagine that the bulb was here. So that was the bulb with its filament. This is the height of from the bottom of the train. So if you imagine here was the train with its wheels and again the light when it was when the train wasn't moving or at least the light from the person on the train whether it's moving or not if you're on the train you're seeing the light do this but if I'm on the train station I see the train whizzing past as soon as the light leaves the train's moving so it looks like the lights doing this so we've got a nice right triangle so we simplify the diagram and have a nice right triangle and we can use Pythagoras's theorem which says that the square of the hypotenuse is the sum of the square of the other sides. So we can say that the height um, here seen by a person outside the train, so the, the person outside the train thinks that the train um, the height of the train is this value here, or the hypotenuse, if you're, if you're not too comfortable with what we've said so far, the hypotenuse. The hypotenuse squared is the sum of the other two sides of the triangle squared. So it won't take you long to orient yourself to our discussion. And then all we've done here to get to so the way I presented it in my notes to my students, 
I've given an equation here and then I've said I can say this because I'm doing this. Um, so I would arguably, if you're not familiar with that top equation, which we're going to use, look at where it came from. So we've got the height uh, here and essentially we're just going to solve for uh, essentially we're going to replace height where I've written height here we're going to replace it with C delta T so I guess I should have written a line here so if you look at the previous page <clears throat> we had We had delta t equals h over c. Okay, so we could have delta t c equals h, where this h is that h okay so that should all make sense now hopefully <clears throat> okay so starting with this equation <clears throat> which essentially again this top equation here is just the cross multiplication of pythagoras's theorem here so taking this equation we can um, or if you like starting just from Pythagoras's theorem I guess so we can just go immediately from Pythagoras's theorem which is this top one here um, <clears throat> we can start to solve for delta t okay so we have we have Pythagoras's theorem here get my pen working okay now we can essentially isolate h by taking the positive v delta t squared uh, over to this side of the equal sign and making it negative that's why it's negative here we've isolated h squared we can see that delta t is in both equations so we can factor delta t out so put it outside the parentheses here delta t squared and then in this parenthesis here we've got the c squared which we have here we've got a minus which we duplicate and then we've got v squared which we have here so we've essentially brought delta t squared out we've factored it out okay All right, let's get the pen engaged again okay so now we're going to bring c squared out well if we bring c squared out we have to have a way to get it back in again so i've just factored the c squared out here so that means i have to put something in the brackets that will pick it up again i put a one in here that means the c squared when it hits that one just becomes c squared again which is great that's what i want but then that c squared is going to hit the v squared so i need to get rid of it and i get rid of it by adding this denominator here so that when the c squared comes back in here it's going to cancel itself with this denominator c squared here okay so i've got this expression here and now i've simply just took that c squared over here and put it here so now I've got delta t squared is this parenthesis here 1 minus v squared over c squared which is h squared over c squared and I've called that um, essentially delta t line squared so essentially the difference between delta t and delta t line 
is a different frame of reference. <clears throat> a different frame of reference. Um, so delta t squared here is if you're watching from the train station. Delta t line here is if you're watching from the train station. Delta t is if you're on the train. Okay, so concluding what we have, if we now take the square root of both sides, we take the square root of delta t, we just have delta t squared, we get delta t. We take the square root of this parenthesis, we get the parenthesis with a square root sign over it. And then finally, the square root of delta t line squared is just delta t. So you can see here that we've got a version of delta t, uh, an appreciation of the passage of time, one appreciation from one frame of reference is unique because it's equal to another frame of reference with some kind of correction. So this correction, this Lorentz contraction here, uh, essentially is our evidence of time dilation. Dilation here means widening or slowing if it were time. So essentially time slows down. That's what time dilation means. Um, so let's see the consequences of this. It's easier just to show you than to give you an audio. Let's say the speed of the train, which is V, is a lot less than the speed of light, which is the case that should be. Then look what happens to the parenthesis, this thing in, in under the radical sign here. Then because V squared is so much smaller than C squared, essentially v squared divided by c squared is zero. So then the radical becomes the radical of one minus zero, which is just the radical of one, and the radical of one is just one. So essentially it makes the two frames of reference the same. So delta t and delta t line are the same. So there's no effectively no time dilation. However, when the velocity of the train approaches the speed of light, uh, and let's say it's equal, I think this is supposed to be a little equal sign here. When it approaches the speed of light, then you've got delta t, so I'm looking at this equation now, <clears throat> then you've got that 1 minus 1 because v squared is equal to c squared and therefore v squared divided by c squared is 1. So you've got um, essentially this whole term becomes zero. And so you've got delta t line equals zero. So that tells you that uh, the passage of time doesn't pass. There is no such thing as the passage of time. There is no ability for time to change in the frame of reference at which you're traveling at light speed. So we've learned that light doesn't age. Uh, for a ray of light traveling at sea, there's no such thing as time, and therefore there's no such thing as the change of time. Um, you know, if you were to say to light, see you, in a, see you in a minute, or see you later, it would have no idea what you were talking about. Okay, so time dilation. Essentially, in a nutshell, the faster you move, the slower time uh, changes. Okay, this is important. Essentially what we've learned from this is the, a way to think of the origin of this expression. This from now on I'll call the Lorentz contraction. Uh, this relationship here, the radical of one minus V squared over C squared, that's what we're gonna need when we start to look at the nuclear binding energy, which is where we're going to head um, Let's see if I can get this done right now. Uh, let's see, it's a couple, it's a couple more pages. Uh, I think we can do it. I don't like these videos to get too long, but I think we can do it. Okay. So let's go on to, let's go on to the next thing. Um, so we're headed towards the nucleus now. We're trying to, Ultimately, this is some background that's going to be needed for you to understand 
the nucleus in as much detail so that we can then start to understand nuclear radiation. Um, okay, so for my class, I've just posted a nice little video uh, by somebody else, wasn't myself, uh, but a nice little video that I had available uh, on YouTube about space time. So this is a quick uh, review of that. Okay, so consider time, T, and space in three Cartesian axes, X, Y, and Z. And that's great. <clears throat> the problem is we can't really understand time dilation if we do that. So we have to combine them, just like Minkowski and Einstein did a um, 100 years or so ago, into space-time. So we have four-dimensional space-time here, where time will call... Uh, zero, we'll just relabel time and the three axes of Cartesian space as zero, one, two, and three. Okay, <clears throat> so we've just rephrased that. So whenever I have a, uh, a symbol zero, I'm talking about time. And whenever I have a symbol one, two, or, th or essentially whenever I have a symbol that's not zero, um, I'm talking about space. Okay, consider regular Newtonian momentum. P, and we'll say it's just equal to mass times velocity. All right. Um, now we're going to start looking at relativistic momentum. <clears throat> now, again, if I use zero, I'm talking about time. If I use anything other than zero, I'm talking about space. Let's just consider the x-axis, so we don't need to look at three dimensions. Let's just consider the single axis of time and one of the considered axes of space. Now, if I'm talking about time, I'm talking about light speed. If I'm talking about space, I'm talking about regular speed. Um, so let's say I have momentum mv in space, space momentum p1, where 1 is the x-axis over here, remember. <clears throat> so I just have um, regular momentum. The only thing is I've got my Lorentz contraction that we just saw in the previous uh, segment. This 1 minus v squared over c squared, this is where it comes from, or this is where it's used. You saw previously where it comes from. So this makes the whole expression relativistic, so it's independent of frame of reference. Um, and likewise, I have my time-like rel relativistic momentum. Uh, again, where I've got my radical 1 minus v squared over c squared. Okay, so that just orients you to where those equations are coming from. <clears throat> Now there's a little aside, we're going to take care of that radical in short order. So let's have a look at this aside. It's a little bit of math for you, and we all love that. So you know from your math classes that 1 plus x to the power n is approximately 1 plus nx for essentially small values of x. So infinitely small values of x, this is a true statement. So if we apply this statement to our radical, because our radical is a denominator, remember, then we've essentially got um, this, ra this one over this radical means radical to the minus a half. So the one over makes the radical negative, and the radical itself is the half the power. So I can rewrite this expression as this expression, so I've got it all on one line and I don't have that awkward fraction. Okay, so for my time-like momentum, I can rewrite this as P sub zero here is MC, and then I've got my denominator written in this new way, one minus V squared over C squared to the minus a half. And I can rewrite that using my uh, Taylor expansion here as uh, one multiple one 
so one multiple of mc plus and now I'm taking my x to be this material here so now I've got n multiples of that well n in this case was minus a half so I bring the x down sorry this n down so this minus a half here now becomes a multiple here well the half knocks out this sorry the negative sign here knocks out this negative and makes it positive okay and then I've got a multiple of mc so a multiple of mc and then I've got v squared over c squared but don't forget I've now got the fraction a half comes down as a coefficient so I've got my denominator 2 here so take a look at that uh, hopefully you can easily see that just by following this Taylor expansion here essentially this Taylor expansion here and applying it over here we get this equation here okay my students can reach out to me if they don't see it okay so now we can rephrase this <clears throat> so we've got our equation we've got uh, the momentum in the time frame of reference p0 is mc plus mv squared over 2c we can multiply both sides of the expression by c so multiply here by a c here by a c and here by a c well then we've just got c p0 which is energy uh, we've got mc squared because we multiplied that mc by a, uh, another c so we get mc squared and then we get mv squared over 2 because the c in the numerator cancels the c in the denominator now we recognize that latter expression as kinetic energy so mv squared over 2 is kinetic energy and Einstein knew that um, we know that if you just consider dimensional analysis we know that uh, a velocity multiplied by a momentum is energy you can look at the unit yourself um, so we know that whatever mc squared is and Einstein wasn't sure what it was but he knew it was a type of energy so overall energy is equal now to the sum of these two types of energy kinetic and other but Einstein um, wasn't exactly sure what type of energy this was but he knew it was energy based on the units and he knew it wasn't potential energy because potential energy is location sensitive and there's nothing to do with location here we've got a mass and a speed squared so what follows and I don't know how long it took Einstein to figure it out probably a few minutes but also probably a bit longer than that was trying to figure out what on earth what type of energy was this mc squared okay so that's what we're going to try and figure out now I can get to the right sheet which I think is over here sheet 4 all right so Einstein knew that mc squared was a type of energy but what type of energy was it okay so we're going to fiddle around with that denominator again that Lorentz denominator that we saw from the time dilation uh, train slide that we had earlier so let this 1 over radical of 1 minus v squared over c squared let it equal to t over tau where t is time and tau is proper time so time could be uh, the time as experienced uh, by an observer in a frame of reference and proper time is the time um, sorry time let tau proper time be the time experienced by an observer 
uh, which is always uh, the rate of change of a second per second. So to the observer, time doesn't change. It's only to an external observer watching the observer that time changes. Anyway, so let this expression here, which you can see is unitless, uh, be a ratio of these two time components, which itself is unitless. And therefore we can rewrite the momentum here, the time-like and space-like momentum. Instead of mc multiplied by this radical, we just say mc multiplied by this fraction t over tau. And the space-like momentum we write as momentum t over tau again. So this looks like a convenient way to write that previous expression with the Lorentz contraction. Now let's consider this invariant quantity, um, which essentially is a separation, um, an invariant quantity, a fixed length, if you like, which would be invariant. Invariant just means doesn't change, so it would be agreed upon by all observers in all frames of reference. So therefore it's a constant and it's a relativistic constant, so we can rely on it and take measurements based off of it because it's a fixed value. And it's the difference between the uh, space-like, sorry, the time-like momentum squared and the space-like momentum squared. Here we square them just because they can, um, at least the, the space-like one can go in the plus and the minus x direction um, you know time squared would imply moving forward and backwards in time i don't want to get bogged down with the moving backwards in time just yet but let's just say we square them so we don't have so we take into account moving backwards and forwards um, along an axis so um, if you accept that this is invariant and i don't see why you wouldn't then let's see what it let's just play it out and see what let's follow the argument so we take this quantity here which is this above quantity here squared so we take this value square it and then we take subtract and then take this other value here and we square it and then we just play it out and see what happens Let's take a chance, because this is what was found to be useful. Um, so we can see here that we can factor out m squared, because there's an m squared in this first term, m squared, and there's also an m squared in the second term. Let's factor m squared out. And then we know that there's also a t over tau squared, t over tau squared, t over tau squared. So we can factor t over tau squared out as well. And then we're just left with a c squared and a v squared. So we have m squared, t over tau squared factored out, and then we can apply them back to c squared minus v squared. Okay, so that's straightforward. Um, <clears throat> We've done this before with the time dilation. We can factor that c squared out again. So if we bring the c squared out, replace it with a 1 and a denominator c squared here so that when the c squared comes back in, the c squared hits the 1 and becomes c squared. The c squared hits the v squared. So if we have this denominator c squared, it cancels the c squared off again and returns just the v squared. So now we've got this nice, what almost looks like a Lorentz contraction term. We just don't have the radical yet. Okay, so far so good. Uh, let's recall our initial assertion that t over tau is actually 1 over the Lorentz contraction. Well, that means that t over tau squared would be 1 over the square of the Lorentz contraction, which gets rid of that radical. Well, that's exactly what I have here, almost. Okay, so I've got essentially this thing over here, this thing over here, if you look at it, 
is actually 1 over t over tau squared. Right? If you look at look at the definition here, so that means I've got a 1 over t over tau squared and a t over tau squared, which cancels. So I just have m squared c squared, which is what we have here. Okay, so I can see that my the difference between p0 squared and p1 squared is just m squared c squared. Okay, that looks straightforward. Now let's move on to conclude what Einstein concluded. And this will bring us to the end of this video. Um, sad for some, joyous for others that are hanging on for dear life. Okay, so let's bring it home. Recall that we've just said in slide four that p0 squared minus p1 squared is m squared c squared. Okay. Let, because it is, don't let it because it's not, let it because it is. Let's say that time like momentum squared is energy over the speed of light squared. And let's just say that P1 squared is, let's just call it momentum squared. Okay. Then we can say that, so again, we've just rewritten P0 squared up here as E over C squared. So therefore we can rephrase this as E over C squared minus P squared is M squared C squared. Okay. Well then if we multiply through by C squared, so essentially if we take the C squared and multiply both sides, well, we can take this P squared over here, make it positive. So then it becomes this p here, p squared. And then we can multiply both sides. Essentially, we can just isolate e squared by multiplying both sides by c squared. So then we multiply the p squared term by c squared to get c squared p squared. And we multiply the m squared c squared term by c squared to get m squared c to the fourth. Well, this is the relativistic energy equation. This is true in all reference frames. It's universally true, therefore it becomes super important. I would just memorize that equation anyway because it's so absolutely correct. Einstein knew this. This wasn't new to him, but it was an insight into what his mc squared meant. So ask, it's not about knowing the right answer. It's about asking the right question. Einstein's genius, one of his geniuses, was asking the right questions. Einstein wondered, what would E squared be at rest? In other words, what is E squared when momentum is zero? So when P squared is zero, you're at rest because P is MV, so P squared is M squared, V squared. Well, at rest, it would be the rest energy squared, right? So at rest, when, at rest, when P squared is zero, that whole term disappears. So this whole term here equals zero at rest. So we're left with E squared is M squared C to the fourth, which we've rewritten here. Well, we take the square root of both of those, we get Einstein's famous equation one of his famous equations, the one that most people are aware of, equals mc squared. What have we learned? We've learned exactly what type of energy this is. This is rest energy. So we knew it was energy all along, we just didn't know what type. But we recreated it by arriving at it when we were at rest, our frame of reference was at rest. So we call E in E equals mc squared, the rest energy, what has that got to do with nuclear chemistry in a general chemistry class? Well, all matter at rest has an atom, or it at least is made of atoms. The atoms at rest have a nucleus. 
The nucleus contains mass. A chemist will tell you all day long that the nucleus is where the mass is. Well, we've just seen that mass and energy are two sides of the same coin. So rest mass, if I can get to it, rest mass and energy are related via a constant. So the mass of our nucleus is equal to its energy or the nuclear binding energy. What's the nuclear binding energy? This is the energy needed to overcome the repulsion between the protons that mutually want to repel each other and annihilate the nucleus. So the repulsion between those like charges should repel. Why don't they? Have you ever wondered why the nucleus doesn't explode? Every nuclei explode. Some of them do, but why don't all of them? Well, that's because of this nuclear binding energy e equals mc squared. And that will conclude this video, and that will lead us into more discussions. Uh, actually, do I have... Let's see if I have... Yes. Um, do I want to end this video now? Actually, no, I want to do one more slide, because then I've got a nice clean break with another video. So, cool. We've got a way to think about the nucleus uh, being stable and about well we're starting to sow the seed of why the nucleus is massive because it's chock a block full of energy so we've just seen the equals mc squared <clears throat> so that means that conservation of mass is not even a thing conservation of mass is a an approximate delusion that we tell our students in other classes lower down classes but by the time you get to second semester general chemistry, you're not in the club. Well, it depends what club you want to be in, but you're headed towards membership of the club. Um, we can afford to be a bit more honest. There's no such thing as conservation of mass, even in chemistry. Um, it's a, a crude approximation that gets you through some elementary classes. Uh, we know that there's no such thing as conservation of mass because... Um, we have energy changes in chemistry, exothermic and endothermic energy changes, so they can't occur if mass were, were constant. Um, so whenever there's a change in energy, which there always is, if something happens, uh, mass is not conserved. However, usually when electrons are all that are moving to change the energy, the energy change is so small that the change in mass is approximately zero. And we can use that to do stoichiometric calculations with moles and what have you. However, now we're looking at the nucleus. The nucleus is so much heavier than the electron that the mass change is going to be, the energy changes is going to be large enough to give a non-negligible mass change. Um, so we can no longer avoid the mass change in nuclear chemistry. Um, and this will, this revelation will be the end of this video. So we will conclude the video here. I hope you enjoyed it. Look out for more videos.